Today's video has been sponsored by our partners at The Sojourn, as this critically acclaimed audio drama returns with episodes 4, 5 and 6 of season 2. Featuring a full voice cast including Dominic Keating from Star Trek Enterprise and Ben Prendergast from God of War Ragnarok and Apex Legends. You can get all episodes of the show, including the entirety of season 1, on Nebula, Spotify, Google Books, Apple Books and more. They're also all available at every tier of the Patreon, links below, with higher tiers getting fun bonus content including the first volume of a behind the scenes art book, ship charts, anthology shorts, a cross section poster and more. If you don't know what the Sojourn is then head over to their YouTube channel for free samples as well as extra lore content and ship breakdowns. The Sojourn Season 2 Volume 2, out now. A few months ago, the press was wowed by Pulsar Fusion's Sunbird concept. This fusion drive space tug design evokes images of a bright future for space travel, where interplanetary trips are routine and easy. But can this concept live up to those lofty ambitions? And what has reality TV got to do with it? What is Alpha? Why is Sputnik hanging out with Voltron? We'll answer these questions and more on today's Space Dock. Our story begins in the 2000s and 2010s, a time of big strides in government-run fusion experiments across the globe, which in turn was fueling private investment in this growing sector. Companies like Helion Energy, TAE Technologies and Tokamak Energy were being founded. It was during this time that one Richard Dynan founded Applied Fusion Systems, or AFS for short. Dynan was an entrepreneur who had first come to fame by starring in two seasons of Made in Chelsea, a reality TV show here in the UK about affluent 20-somethings. He had a passion for fusion and his company sought to attract investment for research and development into advanced materials and technologies, with the overall goal of making a fusion power plant. AFS's website in 2015 points out how the world's energy demands are going up, and how using fusion to meet these demands provides a green alternative to fossil fuels. Sounds good, and we can already see a glimmer of what would become Sunbird even back here a decade ago. 2017, a good year for fusion. Not only had Japan seen the first fusion in a new kind of device, but this was the year that those three companies I mentioned earlier had managed to get plasma in their fusion devices they had built. Though things had not been quite so rosy for AFS, having only managed to come up with a design for a spherical tokamak featured on their website, alongside a typo that sat there for several years. At least Dynan had kept busy during this time, writing a book of his own about the subject of fusion. As he says in a guest lecture, in 2018, the topic has a high barrier of entry due to its complexity. He felt that was deterring potential investors from seeing the potential of the technology, so his book was all about simplifying it down. A children's book as he describes it, though I reckon most kids books don't pad out a third of their length with blank pages, if this review is to be believed. They probably also cost less too. 2017 was also the year that AFS started showing more of its spaceward ambitions, with this fancy render of a branded X-37 possibly acting as a cargo ship for Lunar Helium-3. I'll go over this more later, but Helium-3 is one of the big fusion fuels that are being looked at, though it is a very expensive one. And before we continue, please remember to like the video, it does genuinely help us out a lot. Also subscribe and enable notifications to ensure you get our videos delivered to you. YouTube has been a bit weird about that recently. 2018 was another big year for fusion, with the Fusion Industry Association being founded to be the voice of the industry, and new heights being reached by AFS's competitors. Meanwhile, according to Aerospace Testing International, AFS had apparently started working on ion thrusters and has ideas for fusion thrusters as well. Also, Dynan is quoted as saying, fusion is humanity's only shot at interstellar travel. I'm not sure where this new direction of pushing for going to other stars is coming from, but it's a little removed from this artist's impression of a fusion rocket that they provided. If this looks familiar to you, that's because this is a Vostok, the progenitor for the famous Soyuz rocket, but also the launch vehicle for the much more famous Sputnik. 
They stuck a blue glow on the back of Sputnik's launcher and called it a fusion rocket. This is like when For All Mankind stuck in a photo-bashed version of the real-life Starship, complete with fence as a conceptual futuristic rocket. And this fusion Vostok isn't a one-off mistake either. A simplified version of it is shown at the end of this guest lecture Dynan did that same year. In 2019, we get a bit closer to the Sunbird with the end of Applied Fusion Systems and the founding of Pulsar Fusion, a company doing basically the exact same thing. Don't know why this rebrand was done really, perhaps it was to focus more closely on space stuff. And it did seem to work since it wasn't long before they started development on some rocket engines, which eventually do lead to Sunbird, but the path there is a bit weird. The first thing they developed was a Hall Effect Thruster, a type of ion engine that's been around since the 1960s. These are a very mature technology that sees a lot of use primarily on satellites for getting them to, and then staying, in their final orbits. In recent years, there's been an explosion in their use thanks to dramatically lowered launch costs, meaning more satellites are being sent up. It's a growing market, so it makes sense that a UK space company would want to get into this tech. But this isn't fusion, and neither was the next engine the company made. This thing on the test stand here is a hybrid rocket engine, so called because it uses both a mix of solid and fluid for propellant, rather than just one or the other. The thing is, hybrid rocket engines really aren't that great, which is why they don't see use out there on practical launch vehicles. They're more the sort of thing made by students and hobbyists because of their simplicity. Which begs the question, why is a fusion company bothering with it? Let's see if their YouTube channel can shed any light on it. Oh hey, a big rocket! Maybe they intend to make it their own launch vehicle. Oh, uh, oh no. What is going on? Is this video really implying a plan to fly single stage to orbit with hybrid thrusters and then have those launches manoeuvre with ion engines to self-assemble like Voltron into a fusion rocket? What? I have so many questions! Why have different parts if they can do single stage to orbit? Are they really running a fusion drive around rocket engines? Was this an actual serious plan they had? Why not just buy a ride to space on another rocket rather than developing one? I thought this was a fusion company. Why are they not showing that stuff off? And that question brings us to this year, 2025, with the reveal of that thing we showed in the intro, Sunbird. This is a pure space tug, there's no launch vehicle development going into this thing, just the Hall Effect thrusters the company continued to refine, build and sell. Sounds great, right? The really wild thing about Sunbird though is that it uses a direct fusion drive. That is its shining feature, the amazing efficiency of a fusion thruster that would allow the vehicle to do extremely long engine burns to change its velocity far more than other types of rocket engines. That allows for dramatically reduced travel times, cutting weeks or months off of trips to Mars, Jupiter and beyond. That's at least what the press articles would have you believe this thing is capable of, but let's look a little bit deeper. We're going to examine the impressive looking website pages that Pulsar Fusion have set up for this thing. Ooh, look at the fancy 3D thing and all these exciting numbers, aren't they very posh? Let's hope they don't have any typos on this time. Spoilers, it's worse than typos. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you might have already spotted a slightly important thing that Sunbird is lacking, radiators. Waste heat from electronics and big hot fusion engines is really difficult to get rid of in space because it's a vacuum. You know, that thing used in thermos flasks to slow down heat transfer. So the only way to get rid of heat in space is through radiation, where thermal energy turns into photons which are emitted away. A low heat load can be slowly emitted by the skin of a spacecraft, but radiation is slow. So a high heat load needs specialised radiators that are optimised for the task. But those are totally missing on Sunbird, at least as it currently stands. The next problem is the very optimistic electrical power generation numbers provided. Now this is possible to do, I mean fusion power plants are like the whole reason the technology is being developed right now, and well, a fusion reactor needs energy to run in the first place. But the site lacks specifics as to how Sunbird does this, or how it gets stored. What the website does have though is a bunch of prospective uses for this space tug. These five missions are loosely detailed and say how the Sunbird would do them better than existing methods. And there's some solid numbers here demonstrating just how much more useful having a highly capable tug waiting in space really is. Well, when I say solid, I mean wrong. 
Let's go back up the page a bit and look at these numbers here. These are all delta v, or change in velocity. It's how much a spacecraft can speed up or slow down by. As this page says, you've got to change your velocity by around 9,400 meters per second to get up to orbit. Since you've got to fall so fast sideways, you miss the ground. Then these other numbers are how much you need to change your velocity to go to other places, like Mars. But hang on, these numbers don't match up. In the first paragraph, it's saying you need an additional 1.9 kilometers per second to go to Mars, or an additional 5 kilometers per second for Jupiter, both of which are too low. And then in the second paragraph for the same journeys, there are totally different, but at least more correct, numbers. And then, lower down the page, there's another third set of numbers. Which is it? It's not just for these two trips, either. The values for going to a space station around the moon are simultaneously too high and inconsistent. This number is closer to what you need to land on the moon, not orbit around it. You know what this reminds me of? The way large language models like ChatGPT aren't good at numbers because they cannot do math. That's not how they work, they're just good at predicting the next thing to say. I have no idea if this is what has been used to write the website, but what is clear is that the proofreading here is not great. Just like that long-lived typo on AFS's website. Yeah, see, it was going somewhere. But we're not done with Sunbird just yet. While reading the lunar supply run bit, there's an odd mention of using the Oberth effect. This is the counterintuitive way that doing a rocket burn at higher speeds creates a greater change in velocity. It's a handy trick that means it's most efficient to do engine burns at the lowest point on your orbit. Works great for really high thrust chemical rockets where burns might take minutes at most, but is not so great for super low thrust fusion drives that might need to burn for hours or days. Yeah, it would use a lot less mass of propellant in that time, but it's hardly fast, especially for trips to the moon. You can lose money, and it's still a successful mission if I've saved you time. Next up is the radiation shielding the craft is supposed to have, because this sentence here just reads like techno babble. The space environment is a tough one in terms of radiation for all of these things this other sentence says, but this whole text box really undersells the dangers of radiation from the fusion reactors. Without tons and tons of shielding, the payload would be being blasted with neutrons that would irradiate it, embrittle it, and severely harm anything biological. And yes, there would be neutrons emitted, even from the supposedly aneutronic helium-3 fusion that Sunbird is meant to use. Quick fusion lesson. Atoms, made of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Number of protons determines the element. Electrons whiz around outside. Hydrogen has one proton. Deuterium, it's just hydrogen with a neutron hanging out with the proton. Tritium, still hydrogen, but there's two neutrons at the party with the proton. Helium-3, helium has two protons, the three means there's a neutron in there with them. Fusion is smashing atoms together so hard they mix together, which needs a lot of energy. The easiest nuclear reaction with the lowest energy requirement is DT, deuterium and tritium. They fuse together and make helium-4, you can figure that one out, but have a spare neutron, which goes off and causes mischief. This is all that stuff I mentioned a minute ago. It goes and joins up with a stable atom and makes it unstable and radioactive, or smacks atoms out of place which weakens material and causes havoc to living tissue. All around bad stuff. That's why you need shielding. The next fusion reaction up, which needs a bit more energy, is D and D. Not that one, or that one. Deuterium and deuterium. These fuse into one of two things. Around half turns into tritium and hydrogen, and the other around half turns into helium-3 and a neutron. And this is really awkward because now you've got DT going on as well, spitting out its own neutrons everywhere. This is important to bear in mind for the next level up. And this is where we find the fusion Sunbird is supposed to do, deuterium and helium-3. This needs more energy to do than the other two, and outputs helium-4 and a lone proton. That's it. No nasty neutrons causing problems, right? Well, the issue is that some of that deuterium hanging around in the reactor ends up getting fused with itself. And as we know, DD makes neutrons, and things that also make neutrons. But there's barely any mention of this issue and what they're doing about it on their website. At least the basic idea of using the protons from DHE3 for space propulsion makes sense. That's something, right? Where's all that helium-3 going to come from, though? In various interviews, Richard Dynan makes a big point about being able to charge people for this rare and expensive fusion fuel. So, I can charge you for your helium-3 where I couldn't do that on Earth. 
though doesn't have much to say about sourcing it beyond breeding it. But where? In the Sunbirds? Or in some other space-borne nuclear reactors? I'd like a little more specificity here, since having a good source of helium-3 is kinda needed if you want to use it up to fly places. That's why Helicity Space is looking more closely at DD Fusion for its fusion drive. This is from a scientific article by that company's co-founder and chief scientist, by the way. With all that said, let's recap Sunbird with a handy checklist. Thermal management? No. Power generation? It says so, but not how. Real numbers? No, some of them are wrong. Shielding? Yeah, it's there, but I don't think it's enough, and it's kinda techno-babbly. Fuel source? Kinda hand-waved. Scientific articles? I couldn't find any. There's not any linked on their websites like how Helicity Space does it, but I also didn't see any in search results. Doesn't mean they don't exist, though. So, to conclude, in my opinion, the Sunbird concept seems wildly optimistic. Not only is the concept lacking important details behind how it's supposed to work, it's lacking whole key features like radiators. To be fair here, final vehicle stuff does end up looking decently different to earlier concepts. Just look at the progression made by SpaceX from the BFR concepts to Starship. At least Pulsar Fusion does have experience and knowledge for making and testing space hardware. Their Hall Effect thrusters may not be a super exciting space technology, but they do apparently have clients buying these, and the backing of the UK Space Agency to develop bigger ones. And this is great! Developing the UK space industry is fantastic! I love to see it! But the company isn't called Pulsar Thrusters, it's called Pulsar Fusion. I don't get this weird gap between what they've actually been making over the years and what they're supposedly aiming for. Eh, whatever. I guess we'll see this year because their timeline for Sunbird says static tests are gonna happen, in advance of an in-orbit demonstration of core technology components in 2027. In my opinion, given the strange path that the company is taking to get there, it might be a bit longer before we see Sunbird fly, if it happens at all. You can support Space Talk by joining our Patreon, where you can get our Frigate and Space Fighter design reference books. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching.